Now to understand efficiency, we have to define it. We, we the Two words are thrown out there all the time, performance and efficiency. And maybe you think you have an idea of what these things are, but let's, let's really nail it down. We're going to define performance and efficiency as desired output over required input. And this is not really all that foreign to you. You've probably considered performance or efficiency in many different uh, scenarios. Let's think about drag racing, for example. In drag racing, the metric of performance is distance per time, right? Whichever car has the higher distance for the lower time, and usually it's, of course, the distance that's constant, so the lower time has the higher performance and wins the race, right? So in drag racing, performance is measured as distance per time. In track racing, where you have to negotiate curves and you have to slow down or you fly off the track, in that case, what you're really interested in is changing speed per time. Or in other words, you're really interested in acceleration. So the performance metric is acceleration. To convince you of that, I want you to think of a race car uh, on a track. Okay, so here's some track racing, not just a straight track. Uh, but there's several different directions of acceleration. The one people usually think about for acceleration is, well, give me the biggest engine I can get so I can get the largest forward acceleration possible. But that's really not the only one, right? Would you like to race on a track race with bald tires or tires that have no grip on the road? Probably not, right? You want to be able to go around the curves. Well, going around a curve is a lateral acceleration because acceleration is simply change in velocity per time. Velocity can change not only in magnitude, which is what the engine does, but in direction as well. And so it's very important to have a good suspension system and good tires and a car that can hug the road with a low center of gravity so that you can have maximum lateral acceleration or to the side, right and left. In other words, you want to be able to get around the curve, right? You want very high acceleration rate of change of speed around the curve so that you can maintain a relatively high speed but also have you ever thought about the brakes on a race car you can't just you know put a good suspension system and good tires and a good engine in the car and go and think everything will be okay you also have to have really good brakes because braking what does that do well that causes negative acceleration which you probably would think of as deceleration and so you why would you want good brakes? Well, because you want to approach the curve with as much speed as possible, right? And at the very last second, brake hard to come down to the, just the, the speed where you just barely screech around the corner, right? So that you can accelerate again with your engine and, and beat everybody else, right? So it's really acceleration that is the metric of performance, and it's still a desired output over required input type of thing. It's how quickly can you change your speed with respect to time? How much time does it take to change your speed? And of course, as I'm arguing here, there's forward, backward, right, and left changes in speed also to consider. Professional racing teams know this. That's why they make something called GG plots. A GG plot is just, you might think of a G as a G of acceleration. In fact, that's what this plot is measuring. It's one of the Toyota teams. I'm not familiar with racing, so I don't know exactly which one this is or how long ago it was. Well, there's the date. It's from 2004. Probably the GG plot looks better than this now in that particular team. But basically what this is doing is plotting forward acceleration on the vertical y-axis, negative acceleration, which is braking, right, you know, cornering to the right, acceleration on the right-hand side, and cornering to the left on the left-hand side. Now, what you'll notice is that data points have been taken probably at some regular interval during a, a trial run, perhaps even during racing, I don't know. And you'll notice that there are a lot more points, a lot more density of points on the right-hand side. They're not as far out. They're not spread out as far as on the left. But that suggests to me that there's more right-hand turns, and those right-hand turns actually are not as hard of right-hand turns as the left-hand turns. Because notice the left-hand turns on the left side move out farther. There's more G's of acceleration. Those points are spread out a little farther. So it looks like we've got some relatively gentle right-hand turns, a lot of them, but some extremely hard left-hand turns. Now, you might also notice that the braking system in this car is more powerful than the engine. How do I know that? Well, look at how far back some of these points go. And those are all braking points, right? So the brakes are able to change the speed of the car in less time than the engine takes to change the speed of the car by the same amount going forward, see? Uh, of course, that's not completely fair. They could be throttling, right? They could be the, using the engine for braking as well, sort of a jake brake, which is something you usually associate with, uh, you know, big rigs and things. But it, it could be done on a race car. I, 
I doubt it. They probably use their brakes more than anything. But who knows? If this is a rally sport, then perhaps they use the engine to slow the car down. But, of course, primarily you'd rely on your brakes. Now, an interesting thing about this is that electric cars have really good forward acceleration. And so there's a, a this video I'll have you watch on the white zombie electric car, which was, I think it's back from 2009 or so. It's a, just a guy in his, his garage that liked racing and fast cars. He converted an old... A Datsun car from the 70s into an electric car and was beating the crap out of all the muscle cars at the track. So pretty interesting. Uh, so I'll, I'll require that you watch that a little bit later. So let's go back to our metric of performance or efficiency as desired output over required input and talk about something besides racing. You probably measure fuel economy in your car, or think of it at least, as miles per gallon, right? Well, what is that? Well, miles is your desired output. It's the whole point in buying the car in the first place, so that you don't have to walk those miles. You get to ride those miles, right? That's the whole point of the car. And what do you have to put in? What's the required input? Well, it's gallons. Maybe it's gallons of diesel, or it's gallons of um, you know, gasoline. Or if you have an electric car, it's kilowatt hours of electricity, right? It's still a performance metric miles per you know essentially energy input but there's a problem with this if I tell you that my car gets 45 miles per gallon you might say oh well that's pretty good but I haven't told you one thing I, maybe you know it's a diesel so what difference does that make well it turns out that diesel actually has a little more energy per gallon than gasoline has even high octane fuel has not as much energy per gallon as diesel has. That may seem counterintuitive because diesel is harder to burn, but it's a fact. So it's not really a fair comparison to say that my diesel car is more efficient in the sense that maybe it's just that uh, you know I'm putting more chemical energy into the car and that's why I get more miles per gallon, right? What if uh, what if the energy density of gasoline were ten, or of diesel were ten times the energy density of gasoline? Well, the fact that I get 45 miles per gallon would be equivalent to 4.5 miles per gallon in gasoline, right? That's not all that impressive. It turns out they're actually closer, and the reason for the improved efficiency of diesel engines is something we'll get into a little bit later. But the point is that this metric we've got. The idea of desired output over required input is good, but we don't really like having units that are different in the top and the bottom. I uh, bought a house to fix up. If you ever decide to just come over and talk to me and I'll uh, I'll insult you and I'll uh, you know maybe steal some money from you and you'll be ahead of the game, okay? Do yourself a favor. Don't buy a house to fix up, okay? If you're going to be an engineer, there's nothing wrong with doing it. It's just that there are other places where you can put your energy and come out ahead. As a matter of fact, a quick life tip for you. If you want to avoid paying too much for your house, what do I mean by that? Well, if you want to increase the efficiency of purchasing a home, you don't want to purchase a home and have a 30-year mortgage because if you do that, what will happen is you'll end up paying about twice what the house should cost you. So you buy a $200,000 house, you'll end up paying $400,000 for that house, roughly speaking. It's a bad idea. The, here's the, this is probably worth more than your degree, okay, in terms of, well, that's not true. You're going to earn more money per year, but in one year, this will make you a lot of money. So if you want to buy a house, buy the smallest house you can afford to pay for quickly. Put as much money down on this as you can. You know, maybe a, a one bedroom, one bathroom, not shack. You want something you can resell, but something that doesn't lose value, that appreciates a little bit, but that doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. Pay it off in, you know, five years. Be very aggressive with your payments. And when you're done with that, then start shopping. Shop for your next house for a year or two. In the meantime, keep making those same payments, but to yourself, and put it in an interest-bearing account. So now your money's growing instead of shrinking, where you're not paying someone interest on on your you know, your house. And then you know, find the next house, sell yours, put all the money towards that next house. If you owe a little bit on it, that's okay. Pay it off aggressively, also. And I get, I'd be willing to bet that. Even with you graduating after I've already purchased my house, you'll probably have a nicer house than I do by the time that I'm done fixing up my house. So just a quick life tip for you there. Anyway, I discovered that my economy as or my performance as a drywall finisher is pretty low. I started thinking about, you know, because I was trying to do all the work myself, I started hanging some drywall and trying to tape and bed it with mud and sand it all out. 
and I realized that the amount of area I could finish in one week was pretty bad. As a matter of fact, I looked at it and considered it and realized I'd probably be better off going down the street and working for Taco Bell at minimum wage and then paying someone who was efficient at it to get it done. So my, I found my economy as a drywall fisher was pretty terrible. So all of those metrics, we've got the right idea, right? Desired output over required input, that's great, but we want the same units if we're going to compare efficiency because it's not uh, fair to compare a gasoline engine to a diesel engine with miles per gallon. We need something better. So what we'd like to do is put energy over energy. So output energy units over input energy units or perhaps power over power. So we're going to make our performance metric non-dimensional. So think about a heat engine that produces work. We're going to take the desired output which is the net work output divided by what we have to put in, which is heat input. Now you might say, well, what about the, the heat output? Well, remember, you don't buy a car to warm up the atmosphere, right? The exhaust gas is coming out of your tailpipe is QL, basically. You're not, you didn't buy your car to push exhaust out the tailpipe. You bought your car to produce work, right? That's why you want it, so that it, the engine can produce work pushing your car down the road so that you don't have to push your car down the road. But what's required? Well, you got to pay for gasoline, which ultimately the purpose of the gasoline is to make hot gases above the piston. So it's, it's heat input, right? So network output over what you have to pay for or somehow acquire, total heat input, gives us a dimensionless ratio that we can then compare across a range of engines, whether it's a, you know, a piston cylinder engine or a Wankel engine or a, you know, some other, maybe a Stirling engine or something. We can compare them to one another with a consistent basis because it's a non-dimensional number that we're using for our performance metric or our efficiency. Now we're going to call this thing thermal efficiency and, and it's not thermo efficiency, it's thermal efficiency and it's the network output produced by the engine divided by the quantity of heat input. So notice both of these are energy amounts that we're taking in the numerator and the denominator. And therefore, the ratio is non-dimensional. Now, since the network output from a heat engine has to be the difference between the heat flows, QH and QL, then instead of writing network in the numerator, we can write QN minus Q out. If you consider these as fractions, QN over QN is just one, and then we're left with minus Q out over QN. So thermal efficiency can be written as the network output over total heat input or 1 minus QL over QH, where QL over QH is the ratio of the heat flows across the engine. Now, one of the things people always try to ask is, can we save QL? I mean, this waste heat, can't we do something with it? Because it's kind of disheartening to realize that the thermal efficiency of a typical gasoline engine is somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. Another way of saying that is for every dollar of fuel you put into your car, 20, 10 to 20 cents pushes you down the road. The 80 to 90 percent uh, that's left goes out the tailpipe. Okay, so next time you're putting fuel into your car, I, I hope you remember that and not because I'm trying to make you feel bad, but it's just a fact. So can we save that waste heat? Well, let's consider a very simple heat engine that we'd like to operate on a cycle. In other words, we don't want to build this heat engine and then throw it away and get another one because it's used up. We'd like for it to raise a weight over and over. So it's just a simple piston cylinder device. We've got a gas in here, let's say at 30 degrees Celsius, and we've got a thermal energy reservoir that's at a higher temperature. So say 100 degrees Celsius, because if the reservoir temperature is less than the gas temperature, heat will not flow into the gas. It would flow the other way. So we need a higher temperature reservoir. So we're going to transfer thermal energy into this gas from a 100 degree reservoir. And let's just say we put in 100 kilojoules, okay? And maybe then the gas will get hot, it'll go up to 100 degrees, and in the process it'll push the piston up because the gas wants to expand. And maybe raising that weight that we then remove, maybe this is just an elevator or something, represents a potential energy change of, let's say, 15 kilojoules, okay? So we've, we've managed to use, of that 100 kilojoules we put in, we've managed to do something useful with 15 kilojoules of it. So we've got about a 15% efficiency. And what are we left with? Well, in the third figure, we're left with gases that it's not at 100 degrees, but maybe it's still at 90 degrees. What are we going to do? Well, if we want to use this elevator again, we can't just push the piston down because the amount of work required to push that piston down 
would be the same amount as the 15 kilojoules we've just extracted. So what we have to do is remove 85 kilojoules worth of waste heat to get the system back to where it started so we can operate it on a cycle. In other words, so that we can lift weights over and over and over with this elevator. This is not a very good efficiency. How are we going to get that, that heat out or that excess energy that exists in the gas? How are we going to extract that from this, this bank account system, if you will? Well, we have to have a reservoir at a lower temperature than even 30 degrees. Why? Why not something less than 90 degrees? Well, if it's 45 degrees, we can't go back to where we started, right? Because we need to get down to 30 degrees. So we need a reservoir at, say, 20 degrees Celsius so that we can extract heat and get all that waste energy to flow out. So we can't avoid Q out. Q out just means that, you know, it's something that, I mean, we might try to do better by allowing the load to be lifted in a shorter period of time, don't transfer as much heat in so the temperature doesn't go up as high. That would certainly make it more efficient. But, you know, do you want to sit in your car and it take a year to go down the road to where you need to go? Probably not, right? You need that car to get you somewhere in a certain amount of time. Think of an ambulance. An ambulance has to be able to get people to the hospital quickly. We're not as concerned about efficiency necessarily in that case. So there are cases where we say, you know, we, we really do have to throw away some waste heat because we simply don't have the time to wait forever for processes to move forward. Could we recycle that 85 kilojoules into the 100 degrees Celsius reservoir? There's no way to do that because 100 degrees Celsius is a higher temperature than all the temperatures we see here. Even the closest one is 90 degrees and that's still less than 100 degrees. If we put that thermal energy reservoir in contact with the gas, heat's just going to flow from the thermal energy reservoir into the gas and that's the wrong way. So there's no way to get past this. The point of this is that our engines do not have 100% efficiency and the reason they don't have 100% efficiency has nothing to do with friction. It has everything to do with the fact that low temperature thermal energy is not very valuable. Notice that once the weight was raised in the last slide, the temperature of the thermal energy in the system, in that, that little piston cylinder device, went from 100 degrees down to 90 degrees. It had less usefulness because it was at a lower temperature. And so we had no choice but to throw that waste thermal energy away and start the cycle over again. So the thermal efficiency will always be less than one because we cannot eliminate Q out. And notice that Q out is what subtracts from that, that one, right? It's one minus Q out over Q in. And so since that will always subtract from that one, that one represents 100% efficiency, but we can't get rid of Q out. So we can't have thermal efficiencies that are even at the 100% level. There's, there's simply no way. Now, one of the ideas you might have had when I showed you the power plant cycle a little earlier, you might have said, well, wait a second. The boiler converts liquid to steam, it goes through the turbine, and then the condenser converts steam to liquid. Well, that seems like a waste because there's all this latent energy that you're putting into the water to turn it into steam, and then you take that same amount of latent energy, or pretty close to it, and you just throw it away on the condenser side, right? This seems like a really bad idea. Why not just leave the water in the steam phase? In other words, let's just get rid of the condenser. Why throw away waste energy anyhow? Well, it doesn't work because the system will not keep going, basically. One of the things that happens is the steam coming out of the turbine will destroy your pump. Okay, The pumps don't like steam like that. It won't work. Now we can take some of the work produced by the turbine and drive the pump. In fact, that's, that's commonly what's done. But a, a turbine that produces a couple hundred megawatts can easily produce enough power to drive a, a pump that only requires, you know, maybe 70 to, to 500 kilowatts. It's, it's a small fraction, right? So back driving the pump, that's no big deal. But this conversion and completely eliminating the condenser doesn't make any sense. We can't get rid of Q out. In fact, what you just saw there where we just had heat flowing in and work flowing out is a violation of what's called the Kelvin Planck statement. So you can see Kelvin Planck uh, dates of life and, and pictures here. And their statement of the second law is that it is impossible for any device that operates on a cycle to receive heat from a single reservoir and produce a net amount of work. In other words, what you're seeing here can't be done. We can't just take in thermal energy 
at a rate of let's say 100 kilowatts and produce work at a rate of 100 kilowatts continuously. You might have a system that can do it for a little while, but the amount of energy in the system has to change and um, ultimately you, you can't keep it going. That's what operating on a cycle really means. So this is the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law. There are other statements, we'll study one other, and we will see that those two statements are in fact equivalent.